uh, Professor Vaishabhaya Raju sir. So you know that uh, nomenclature of plants provides a means of communication and is an uh, unambiguous reference system and about the elements that uh, constitute biodiversity. The nomenclature of plant is governed by the International Code of Nomenclature that in principle aims at having one correct name for a taxon on the basis of priority of publication. The application of the rules of code and taxonomic Excuse studies me, involving change of uh, circumscription of taxon, it reflects me, only the mobility is not visible, sir. Sir, your screen. screen is not visible, sir. You need to share your screen. screen is not visible. No, yeah, sir. It no, is sir. gone, sir. Now it is disappeared. Initially, it was there. Sir, sir, it is a problem from my side. I am going live. Uh, give me a few minutes, only two minutes. Okay, okay. I'll be sharing. Yeah, you continue, sir. All the participants, please wait for two minutes. The screen will be visible. May I continue or? Uh... Sir, please continue, sir. Okay. Okay. Now it is okay. It's okay. Yeah, that application of the rules of code and taxonomic studies involving the change of uh, circumscription of taxon reflects only the more confused state uh, uh, it was. Yet the rules of nomenclature, notably the principle of priority, cannot be ignored to prevent any confusion in botanical studies. The why or the need of the correct nomenclature is well answered by Davis and Haywood. The biologists must know what organism they are making with before they can pass on information about them uh, to other people. A function of taxonomy which makes stability of nomenclature and important consideration. A taxonomy, a science of classification, the orderly arrangement of phenomena to facilitate the efforts of human mind to understand them is referring to discrimination of species and other groups and arranging them in a system of classification. So nomenclature is a process of uh, determining the correct name for units according to the code. It's here underline the code. Code is important for nomenclature. Two, taxonomy includes identification, nomenclature, and classification. So these are the, the cune of biology. The subject is taxonomy is the cune of biology, but nomenclature is and should be independent of taxonomy. You should remember nomenclature is independent of taxonomy. As quoted by uh, McNeil, nomenclature is handmade of taxonomy and not mistress. Further, he added the principle of nomenclature that is function to serve the taxonomy. Here, uh, uh, we are for taxonomy, we are doing taxonomy, but even though we should know the nomenclature that is behind the rules of rules of several rules that is a code. Here we have to see the international code of nomenclature that is ICN. So ICN previously it was uh, called as ICBN, but now it is changed to ICN in uh, 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 that uh, last conference, uh, International Botanical Congress in Melbourne in July 2011. It was first introduced by Linnaeus in 1751 in his uh, Philosophica Botanica. And a detailed account of botanical nomenclature, it was established by A.P. D. Kandol in 1813 in his uh, theory, Elementaire de la Botanique. It is the very basis for the first uh, the International Congress in 1867 at Paris. The law of botanical nomenclature is called Paris Code at the time in 1867, or otherwise it is called as De Candolle's Rules. And you know that uh, uh, the, the history of nomenclature, it was started from the, the first appearance of this book, Louis de la Nomenclature Botanic by APD Candolle. So it was the Paris Code also. In 1867, it was the, the results of Paris Code. And you know that uh, uh, later, unlike uh, uh, modern code, this old code, it is contained the recommendations for naming to serve as the basis for discussions on the, uh, the controversial points of nomenclature, rather than obligatory rules for validly published and legitimate names within the code. So it was organized as six uh, sections with 68 articles in total at the World Court. 
the multiple attempts to bring more expedient or more equitable properties to uh, the botanical nomenclature resulted in several comp competing courts, which finally reached a compromise with 1930 uh, Congress. In, in that meantime, the second edition of the International Rules followed the Vienna Congress in 1905. Uh, the rules were published as Reckless International's DILA Nomenclature Botanic. Uh, D Vienna in 1905. So uh, some but not all the subsequent meeting of the International Botanical Congress have produced a revised version of these rules later called ICBN and then ICN. So now we are on the ICN, the code decoded. So maybe next slide. Uh, the user guide, uh, the International Code of Nomenclature uh, for all game, uh, fungi and plants, has, uh, it, it has published in 2018, January. And again, it has uh, the explained, for this explained uh, code has published as uh, the code decoded by Nicolas Terland. It is a user guide to the interface ICN and uh, it is available freely on the website. Also, I have given the website uh, I have in the website. The purpose of the second edition of the, the code decoded is serve as a user guide and specifically for Sengen code. The objective of the guide has been to create a text that is reasonably clear and simple, which inevitably means it will fail to cover every rule and every circumstances that you uh, uh, this will encounter. So it is a very simple guide would be forced to gloss over some important details. The current system of biological nomenclature dates back to the mid 18th century uh, when Swedish naturalist Carlos Linnaeus uh, published his species Plantarum and Systema Naturae in which introduced the binomial system. A binomial is the name of species and is considered to be the basic taxonomic unit. Uh, the next slide, please. You know, the, the code is uh, differ from uh, the botanical code is different from some other codes. You uh, know, biology requires a precise and simple system of nomenclature. Uh, no, it, it is it has uh, the six objectives. You know, this code, particularly the Sengen code, it has given fourteen points in the uh, preamble. Preamble means that is an introduction. Introduce the code. And it, it is with the 14 points very clearly and how to read the code, how to follow the code, everything it has given in the preamble. You see the preamble, the principle of from the base, basis of system of nomenclature governed by this code. The detailed provisions are divided into rules, articles, and recommendations. So it has given several examples and footnote and, and everything. A glossary, that is each and every word used in the code has clearly expelled in the, explained in the, uh, they are defined in the terms in the glossary. The objective of the rules is to put the nomenclature of the past into order and to provide for them, for that of the future, names contrary to rule cannot be maintained. So these are all they have given in the preamble. So next please. No, the uh, code, uh, the nomenclature section of 18th International Botanical Congress in Melbourne, Australia made major, major changes. You know, all previous code, every code has uh, uh, some uh, somewhat changes or it is brought from the previously recommended, uh, uh, recommended portions to the this next code. But in Australia code, as in the Melbourne code in 2011, it has made major changes. All these three points I, uh, I would like to point out. The first one is the code now permits electronic publications. So only publication of names of new taxa, no longer will it be a requirement to deposit some paper copies in library. So they have allowed, the code has allowed it to uh, the publication maybe in electronic. And another one important things, one fungus, one name, and one fossil, one name are important changes because the whole previous Congress, it was not included the algae and fungi in the nomenclature system, but now it has uh, sunk into the algae and fungi and other uh, photosynthetic protista in the 
a nomenclature system. So we have to consider all these things, the fossil and fungus also. The concept of anamorph for fungi and morphotaxa for fossil have been eliminated. You know, fossils, every part of fossils we have given separate name. For example, lepidocarpon, that is for uh, uh, the fruit of the uh, particular fossil, lepidophyllum. The same plant, suppose the leaf is there, that is a lepidophyllum or lepidorhiza, like that, uh, lepidocarpon, lepidodendron. So, food is a lepidodendron. So, like that, for a same plant in different part, we have given different names. So, now it is eliminated. We have to give the one particular name for a particular plant. So, that uh, concept was uh, established in that recent conference. As an experiment with the registration of names, new fungal descriptions appears, the use of an identifier from a recognized repository. There are two recognized repositories so far, Index Fungorum and Mycobank. You know that uh, uh, even uh, we have angiosperm plant or flowering plants, we can easily uh, preserve as a herbarium and deposit in a herbaria, but the very difficult to deposit for a type specimen as a fungus and the algae or uh, the prokaryotic or sometimes microscopic organisms. So it has to be also preserved as a type, maybe preserved as a that mycobank or any kind of repositories. So that should be established in the recent conference. So next one. You know that uh, the it, it was uh, there in the previous one. So outcome of the the most significant outcome of the the 19th International Botanical Congress that is Shenzhen. Uh, so it has also uh, uh, established some important changes. So first one is amendment of division three that deals with the governance of the ICN, how to manage the code. So we have established every conference in some code, but how to manage it should be permanent or it should be changeable. So like that, the uh, governance of code also be amended. And combination rules and recommendation that solely deals with fungi in a separate chapter of the ICN. For fungus, it, the nomenclature is included and everything established for the nomenclature section or code has been established for fungi, but even though that conference should be held in separate one. Therefore, that mycologist, they should have uh, evolved their own uh, concept for nomenclature, but it should be included in the ICN. So it was established. So this further included decision to refer decisions on the and these rules that only apply to fungi to the International Mycological Congress. Yes, it is the same. And establishing a registration committee that will investigate the mechanism for creating a framework for future registration of algal and plant names. This is an important thing. So we have to register all the names. Suppose if we just uh, publish a new taxa, that, be, that should be registered in uh, uh, the common platform. So that has evolved. Next one. Know that, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, so we are, uh, we have uh, the conference uh, in the, all these codes, all these code established a particular conference. So already uh, this many number of uh, uh, code has been uh, published. You know, yesterday, uh, the, uh, uh, I think what's where Rajasar have been ex explained. Uh, so all these codes and important uh, decision taken from the code. And the last code is Sengen code. Now it is 2008, it was published, but 2017, it was held in uh, China. And uh, every code has an important things. I will point out in a later slide, what are the important uh, that uh, decision taken from these things. So now it is a structure of Sengen code. You know, every code has a structure, but I told you that already, or the earlier codes, the primitive codes, they don't have any structure, but now it has come after the 1950s, we should have a permanent structure of the, our botanical code, or ICBN or ICN. Now the Sinjian code has the three divisions and uh, glossary indices and appendices. You know, Division one is principles, that is the objectives of the course. Division two is rules and recommendations, that is a major part of the nomenclature. Division three is provisions and governance. It is only about the code and how to uh, the, we maintain the stability of the code, uh, everything it has been given in the provisions for governance. And glossary, I already told you, these are the definitions for each and every, the code terms used in the code. And indices, uh, 
and appendices seven appendices are there will be going into the in detail next one will going into the the every principles so i told you already that evolution of the structure of code this structure has been evolved from different codes in different times the paris code in 1867 and agreeing the rules like linnaeus rules of nomenclature because linnaeus uh, 1753 it has been published the known plant names in the binomial system so that was approved by this code the linnaeus rules of nomenclature in 1867 approved that code and rules of priority author citation rules of acceptance and rejection of names so these are the four important uh, uh, the decision was taken from the 1867 paris code and later vienna code in 1905 agreeing the following rules linnaeus species plant order with the starting point of nomenclature they have uh, put the milestone of our uh, the botanical science from the species plant order and next generic name should be conserved called nomina generica conservanda they have started the conservation of name against the changes are like that so and, and then important thing latin diagnosis should be accompanied for names you know every new taxa or every new positions if you are going to describe in taxonomy we have to uh, the adhere for the latin diagnosis or description of the particular things in uh, the latin so that should be important uh, that was uh, decided by in 1905 and taxonomy was not accepted in plant taxonomy this is one of the major uh, uh, the part of uh, our nomenclature you know the repeated the they exactly repeat the generic uh, name into the specific epithet that was stopped by the taxonomy so it was not accepted in the plant nomenclature then date of publication was not uh, alone accepted for priority so it has been decided in 1905 later 1975 the present code structure was evolved you can see principles rules and recommendations so this can be divided in 75 and 88 1988 berlin code first time introduced nomina specifica conservanda that is conserved the species name you can see the example lycopersica mesculentum for tomato plant triticum astivum for wheat plant it need the names was uh, conserved under the nomina specifica conservanda we cannot change uh, once it is conserved under the this rule and finally tokyo code in 1994 registration of new names has been uh, introduced so these are the some of the evolutionary structure it is a, the birth and evolution of the code already it has been discussed so now it is a, the brief outline of the sengen code you know uh, the what are the other uh, sections and chapters uh, uh, the appear in the, the present sengen code the division 1 principle already i told you that it has been six principle again we are going into detail in the principles and division 2 it is rules and recommendation you can see it has uh, divided into eight chapter chapter 1 tax and their ranks it has uh, divided under five articles 1 to 5 and uh, chapter 2 state as typification and priority of names these are the important thing it has the four sections section 1 status definition article 6 section 2 typification article 7 to 10 and section 3 priority article 11 and section 4 limitation of the principles of priority article 13 to 14 and another one important thing i have given in the the red letters that is important only for fungus no f3 f chapter f means that is mycologist have been evolved but that is uh, under the section of the icn code but it is a separate code for fungus so that is a fungal chap fungus chapter fungi chapter and chapter 3 nomenclature of taxa according to their rank so it has been divided six sections you can see the names of the uh, taxa above the rank of family so how we can uh, the coin the term above the suppose the above the family rank order or super order like that how we can try uh, that evolve the name and section 2 names of families and sub families tribes and sub tribes and section 3 names of genera and subdivision of genera section 4 names of species so you can see the article every article it should be defined to how to uh, uh, how to frame the name for a particular rank of taxa and the chapter 4 effective publication so this is another one important thing for nomenclature suppose where we are going to publish our uh, uh, so newly published taxa or uh, uh, other thing so it has been effective publication uh, the following chapters they have 
uh, evolved uh, the section effective publication and uh, the article 29 to 41 all these articles explained about the effective publication so next time so you know uh, the chapter 5 you no know, valid publication uh, it has been given some provisions general provisions names of new taxa new combination names that new ranks replacement of names and everything it has been given in the chapter 5 and at chapter 6 is citation and section 1 other citation the section 2 is uh, a general recommendations on citation so these are all the important things for nomenclature and chapter 7 rejection of names here uh, also the for fungi the separate chapter will be there for article 59 is uh, only for fungi the name of fungi uh, with the pleomorphic life cycle that's a fun fungi chapter 8 in chapter f f means fungi and chapter 8 of the the uh, second division the orthography and gender of names so these are uh, we have to follow when we are uh, latinizing because the the recent uh, modification we are not going to give full latin diagnosis for when publish uh, the new name of the tax it is only the uh, the latinization of names so latin endings uh, are uh, the orthography that is important it has been given in the all the five section of the uh, the chapter 8 and uh, here uh, and another chapter is attached with the chapter 8 that is called the chapter height means hybrids names of hybrids it has 12 articles height 1 to height 12 the how uh, we can coin the term or new name for the cultivated species and hybrids so these are the separate chapter for the hybrids and division 3 it is already told it is around provisions eight provisions they have given the first provision is general provision for governance of the board how can we maintain the board and the sex provision to proposal to amend the board so any modification or any changes if we want to we can propose the with the particular evidence so we can propose to amend the board provision 3 is institutional words that is uh, Uh, that 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 is uh, uh, no uh, every institution has been uh, it has to be voted in the conference uh, uh, so uh, how what are the rules governed for this so provisions they have given and nomenclature section several committees are there under the nomenclature section what are the committees what are their role everything it has given in the provisions and the provision 5 procedure and voting at the nomenclature section at the time of conference uh, what are the role of institution and uh, other committees and provision 6 after an international botanical congress for example publication of that code and publication of the uh, the decision of the conference or uh, deliberation of the conference so that was after an international botanical congress so everything it was given in provisions and provision 7 is permanent nomenclature committees uh, provision 8 is proposal to amend the code relating solely to names of organism treating as fungi this only for fungi and the again a glossary definition of terms used in this code elaborately they have given for all uh, the names are names used in the code it is defined uh, the very precisely and appendix you can see the seven appendices operatic oppressor that means uh, the suppressed works operatic oppressor means that means uh, a suppressed work unpublished work uh, it has to be published even though that has been uh, considered as a good nomenclature or it is essential for the nomenclature it has to be published the house suggested it in the the first appendix and uh, the appendix 2 is listing conserved names and families so uh, for uh, spermatophytes particularly and appendix 3 you can see the nomina familiarum algarum fungorum pteridophytorum fossilium conservanda et regidenta so conserved and rejected names of algae fungi pteridophyte and fossils and section 3b nomina embryophyte and spermatophyte again conserved and rejected names and 3 appendix 3 is nomina generica conservanda et regidenta that means a generic name to be conserved or to be rejected said so everything it has been listed out and affixed with the appendix in the code and you can see nomina specifica conservanda et regidenta that was recently i told you that recently established uh, uh, the section of the appendix and finally nomina utic regidenta the already some of the published work be even though that should be uh, uh, rejected so what are the work should be rejected they have given the list uh, in the list 
and finally the binding decision on a descriptive statement and the final append is binding decision regarding confusability of names so these are all listed out very clearly for entire uh, uh, the plant kingdom and they have been uh, given in the appendix uh, in the very peculiar manner so next slide you know the principle next we are going to see the principles so all the six principles uh, uh, so already uh, uh, yesterday it was also explained by professor varsavya raju and it it is a very stable one from the last uh, uh, many conferences or many ibc the same but only the first principle is somewhat rephrased in the last uh, uh, the sengen code you know the second sentence this code applies equally to names of taxonomy group treated as algae fungi plants whether or not these group were originally so treated so this is only added and everything is uh, so before it was there so next slide we are going to detail in every principle with examples you know the first principle the nomenclature of algae fungi and plants is independent of zoological nomenclature yes or prokaryotic nomenclature now it has been added so prokaryotic also some of the microscopic organism is now it is included are covered under the icn so that's why they have added this prokaryotic nomenclature also so international code of nomenclature of prokaryotes is separate that is a nomenclature committee of bacteria or a icbn uh, international code of bacteria nomenclature committee is entirely different it is not covered under this rule and next one is that 2008 uh, revision has been published in the international journal of systematic evolutionary microbiology and approved list of bacterial names so that is separate and also virus classification nomenclature uh, that is separate you know now zoological nomenclature is separate so it is independent of our botanical nomenclature one specific things we have to see all other nomenclature system is tax uh, taxonomy is accepted where in the first principle we are taxonomy is completely avoided so this is only the major thing in the first principle next one the principle 2 it is uh, interest interested to the typification the application of names of taxonomic groups is determined by means of nomenclatural types you know if whenever we are uh, proposing a new names for taxa that uh, particular uh, uh, the taxa or the plant must be preserved as a type so that is called a typification process is called a typification here usually we are preserving as a herbarium specimen then when we are writing on the specimen that name is permanently attached you know we have a several typification that is most important typification system only the most important for uh, uh, when we are naming the new taxa so holotype the primary specimen upon which name is based designated at the time of publication whenever if you are going to publish a new taxa you should have a, the first tweak which we are going to describe the taxa must be preserved permanently when when you are writing the name of the particular seed herbarium seed that is a holotype so that is original author is selected by the, the when and at the time of publication that is a holotype that must be preserved permanently that is a holotype and similarly duplicate holotype that may be called isotype uh, it collected the same time by the same person from the same place that is of isotype and leptotype suppose the uh, about two types it was missed or replaced or something it is destroyed we have to go for an uh, any one old collection from the the same plant that may be designated as a leptotype and neotype means completely all other type specimen trees destroyed we have to collect in the same plant at the place try to collect from the same place that may be designated as a new uh, neotype so these are the process are there lot of process are there i will uh, explain you clearly in the next slide go, go to next slide so you can see the various types and their level of important based on uh, seeber kate 1984 and slightly modified so these things you can see the first column i have put the red arrow mark these are the a b c d four uh, level of uh, uh, the designation the process is four level the first you can see the level is a primary level first we should have the holotype any taxa or any name suppose if you are going to propose in taxonomy you should have a holotype the primary type suppose primary type is uh, missed or it may be destroyed 
or if you are uh, it may not be designated in the protologue or uh, first published uh, that the manuscript uh, we should go for lectotype from the old old one old specimen or nearly uh, the the time of uh, specimen collected from the the period of uh, the other uh, that may be the lectotype or this again it was collected many lectotypes are there we have to our lectotype may be destroyed we have to second time lectotype and even all those lectotype and holotype missed that is a neotype you know secondary level is I, we have to select from isotype the isotype also you can see isolectotype and finally isolectotype it may be all the previous type may be destroyed we can go for ap type so ap type means uh, uh, that is uh, only the descriptive uh, the additional description it has to be and given for the ambiguous specimen so that has been uh, it is called ap type so these are the things when we are seeing the name of the taxa. Next one. So I'm giving the flow chart clearly for uh, the designation of child. So it is a flow chart for uh, typification. Is there holotype? Suppose uh, when the author described the holotype uh, at the time of publication, he, uh, he mentioned the holotype means we cannot do anything for uh, the typification, but uh, is, oh, that that means yes. Is there holotype means the protologue clearly mentioned holotype that is uh, preserved or deposited in the, any kind of uh, any public herbarium? Yes means we uh, can't do nothing. And if no the holotype is there already a lectotype or neotype? So we have to see carefully. Uh, any anyone can recognize the lectotype or neotype of the for the same uh, species or for the same name. If yes means we can't do nothing. So it is not recognized to holotype or lectotype or neotype. The protologue was not mentioned in the, uh, uh, any type material. Uh, so we can, any other uh, isotypes, it may be deposited in the herbarium, we have to check. So if any one uh, type specimen or old specimen are available, uh, that can be designated as them lectotype. So lectotypification, suppose holotype and any other type missed in the protologue or it was not designated, it was not, uh, but name only, uh, the legitimate name is there, we can go for the lectotypification. So again, lectotype is not there. The, uh, are there any syntype or isotype, isosyntypes? So similarly from the old her herbarium and old seeds for the same taxa, we can again designate from the, the syntype seeds, it may be erected as a lectotype. So these are also not there or uh, not designated or it is if once designated that was not there in the herbaria, it is, uh, uh, it is not there. So again, are there any other elements of original material, unsighted specimen, sighted illustration, unsighted illustration that may also we can designate it as a lectotype. So if it is not there, all the types were not available, uh, are not available to the public or not there, so we can designate as a neotype. So it is a, the flow chart of the typification. So next slide. Next one. Sir, I'm stuck please. here, sir. Yeah, please. I am just stuck stuck with this, this oh, slide, sir. I can't go. Okay, okay. So I'm giving some example for uh, uh, these things. So how they are designating as uh, the type and everything. Sujit, what's the problem? Sir, few minutes. Sir. Uh, it yeah, has started. Yeah, I'm no, not okay, sure. Okay. Uh, in one minute, I will resume, sir. Yeah. Sir, it's stuck.
yes sir i think we can resume the session okay no problem so now it is uh, the typification is important now the third principle is uh, the nomenclature taxonomy group is, is based upon priority of publication yes for a uh, previously uh, the communication system was uh, uh, the very problem no, not like that not now now is very very uh, 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 very fast and we can communicate everything within a minute but the previously independently publish the name of the taxonomic names in every countries every region and every part of the world and they have published their own uh, manner they have published many number of uh, names for a single species so that was a problem but even though that was published legitimate and validly published like that but now is problem we are or uh, looking all those names several names are superfluous that is uh, for a single species many names are there so which name is selected or suitable or correct name we have to identify the correct name so this rule name uh, the principle 3 it has to be only a single name for each and every one of the taxa the nomenclature of taxonomic group is based upon priority of publication which one legitimately published first that name is only acceptable or correct name you can see the example uh, here i have given the two the uh, sites one is the, the plant list site the serapegia previtubulata bedom is to have been published 1784 and another one is prakistelma bedomi hooker uh, uh, f1883 and brakistelma previtubulatum gamble 1921 you can see that all the three names based on the the same specimen the same type bedom was first collected uh, in 1874 he named serapegia previtubulata and later the same serapegia is uh, transfer cooker transfer to brachistelma and brachistelma bedomi he named and again gamble brachistelma previtubulatum he named because of the basionymus previtubulata he just named previtubulatum it was appeared in plant list but you know priority of publication it is only serapegia previtubulata is uh, the right name for the uh, uh, the species or taxa according to the uh, priority of publication so now i think now the plant list is not uh, updated one they are uh, stopped to update uh, but many people now we are lay on the plants of the world online you can see the plants of the world online in the left slide the uh, authentics are the right species is serapegia previtubulata and the synonym of synonyms are brachistelma previtubulatum is a synonym so these are the things when we are go for the uh, the uh, priority of publication we have to select the right name if the taxa has more number of names next one the next slide please yeah principle 4 each taxonomic group with a particular circumscription position and the rank can bear only one correct name the earliest that is in accordance with the rules except the specified cases so some of the every tax site should have a only one correct name even though many names are there but except some specified cases you can see already many names we have used since the past but some of the names also Uh, except from the rule that that may be listed under nomina conservanda or what are the rules may be changed also they have been clearly explained in the particular context of the article 185 under the principle fourth you can see the following names of long usage are treated as validly published you can see the the composite normally all our botanists our teachers they can say the composite for astrace but astrace is a right name because every family name that should be started with their stem of the genera or stem of the genus you know aster is the uh, the basic uh, or fundamental genus of the family astrace that is a rule that is a rule of the code you know the every family name should be uh, ended with uh, aca 
but the prefix must be there in the the generic name of the particular family aster is the stem of the genera of uh, uh, asteraceae so asteraceae is a right name for compositae compositae is a common name but also we this name is conserved against the rule we can use it it is not a, a, a it's not a wrong when we are using the compositae also that may be conserved Similarly, Cruciferae, the nomum alternum, the changed name is Brassicaceae. Brassica is the type genus, Brassicaceae. Graminigae, Poaceae, Alpoa is a type genus, Poaceae is a right name. Gattiferae, Blusia is a type genus, Blusiaceae. And similarly, Labiatae, Leguminosae, Palmae, Papilionaceae, Amelliferae. So all these names, uh, these are all uh, should be followed the rule, we have to change the normal alternate. But even though these names are also conserved, when the Papilionaceae are re regarded as a family distinct from the remainder of the Leguminosae. So Papilionaceae is somewhat uh, uh, different from the Leguminosae at the nomenclature level. The name Papilionaceae is conserved against Leguminosae. Still, we can, Papilionaceae is uh, not wrong when we are using, but that, that is uh, conserved against Leguminosae. Next slide. Yeah, now the principle fifth, the scientific names of taxonomic groups are treated as Latin regardless of their derivation. Here, most important, Latin diagnosis is important for uh, the taxonomy. We should know some uh, uh, the taxonomic terms. So many people who are uh, asking me or uh, all the taxonomists, uh, somebody will, uh, 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 that they are thinking about how they are remembering all those names. It's a very simple, suppose if you know the, the Latin uh, terminology. So it's a very simple, what we are talking in our, or what we are using the word in our normal uh, colloquial language, same thing, the same meaning is there in the botanical language also. But botanical language is Latin or Greek. The scientific language is also Latin or Greek. You know, the name of the character, Alba White, Micra Black, Alcha Lofty, Actis Ray, Anthos Flower. So like that, all these names are character. But the same thing we are using in our... Uh, uh, normal uh, language also. Name of the habitat, aquatica, aquatic. Terrestris, uh, terrestrial. Monticola, mountain living. Herbicola, living with herbs, so like that. Even now, origin of place, we should be name of the taxa. Whenever we are collecting, for example, Nallamala, we are collecting, we name this Nallamalayana. Bless our origin of place, we should first collected. So similarly, the world botanist also they have named. If um, first time they have collected from the Madras, Madras Patana. Madras Patana is a world name was there for Madras or Chennai. So Madras Patana. Uh, so like that, Indiga from Indian origin, Japonica, Japanese origin, Ethiopica uh, from origin from Ethiopia, like that. So they, they have given the, so you know, you hear the source of the nomenclature is from the local language and only the Latin ending. So Latinization, these names are not from Latin, but Latinization was there. So this is the process of the taxonomic nomenclature. We can give any name, any word we can, the source of the name, uh, name from any, any language or any source, but only the Latinized ending must be important. So now it is only followed this. Uh, recent rule, all our Latinization that was eliminated, but but Latinization, Latin description, diagnosis was eliminated, but Latinization must be there in the botanical nomenclature. Even more uh, commemorated words, even 95% of our botanical nomenclature are uh, plant names or commemorated names, either place or from person or for some others, only for commemoration. We are uh, giving the commemoration to some other. Bedomi for Colonel Bedom, Whitey for Robert White, for Reedy for one read, a cookery like that. Or, uh, so suppose every taxonomist, they, what they feel, no? Uh, suppose when we are describing a new taxa, new species, we have to uh, commemorate our teacher, our lover. You know, uh, the same, it was started from our Linnaeus. Linnaeus, uh, he named all the families, all the uh, genera, all most of the species only dedicated to their friends, family, who are all uh, uh, around him at the time. He named for all. For example, Moria Lily uh, is a uh, uh, wife of uh, Linnaeus. He named Moraceae. Moras is a genus, Moraceae on family. Liliaceae is a genus, uh, Liliaceae is a family, Lilium is a genus. Yes, dedicated to all, 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 all his wife. 
So like that, everything it has started, but it's only because of the Latinization. Next one, please. You know, the last rule, uh, sixth rule is nomenclature are retroactive unless expressly limited, expressly limited. So this everything, all the rules taking effect from the date in the past, the past conference, IBC is important. They are brought out from all the rules from the earlierly published code. So this is the last tool. So every code, every uh, the IPC conference, International Botanical Congress, our code is expressly limited. So this is the things. And next one, you know, important steps of nomenclature. So here after, uh, when we are reading all those things of this engine code or any code, we should have uh, some steps for uh, uh, nomenclature. We uh, suppose if we are coining the terms for new taxa or other things, first we should uh, uh, go through the ranks and, and endings of the taxa. It is depending on the rank. So what is the rank, either species or genera or uh, genus or uh, above the genus level, family, order, like that, we should give the, the particular endings of the taxa with position, particular position. Next, priority of publication. We have to see, already it was published, legitimate names are there, or published validly or not, we have to see. And then type methods. The, uh, it is important thing in the steps of uh, taxonomy. And next, synonyms related definitions. So when we are giving any names, we should see the synonyms also. Already any names are there related to uh, our uh, uh, proposed tax are like that. And finally, citation of other. This is uh, now many are confused. Suppose we, you are publishing a, a new species uh, uh, the, in that paper, uh, others may be more than 10. Even recently, some papers appeared like that, even more than five others. All the, the paper authors or title authors may not be uh, the author of the species or author of the particular taxa. So they should be mentioned in the paper or in the communication very clearly who are the author of the taxa that is separate. So now many people are confused if it is title is the new species from the uh, uh, Delangana, maybe the uh, three or four or five members may be the author, but but the they have given clearly in the uh, manuscript or protologue who are the author of the taxa, but that name, new species, the author is different. Citation is important. And names of cultivated plants, so it has a, a, a separate section in the its engine code, so it should be studied thoroughly. Suppose if you are giving new name for the cultivated species. And finally, Latin diagnosis. So it is important uh, when we are going to give the name of the tax of our either men or women or place or which place we are going to give, the endings of that, uh, the Latinization must be important. Uh, somebody maybe, uh, for example, Raghavi, Raghavi, uh, one of the, uh, uh, it's a, maybe we are considered Raghavi as a, a woman name. Uh, suppose we are going to give a, a uh, commemoration for that name Raghavi, somebody they have given the Raghavi, but that's a woman, it is a wrong. It's I is coming means that is a man. But Raghaviana, that may be a right name. So like that, we have to see the lighting diagnosis and Latinization of the name and which name or which plant we are giving the name uh, for which person, suppose a commemorative name is either masculine gender or feminine gender and everything we should be very careful when the diagnosis in the Latin. And finally, effective and valid publication. So, you know, I put it in the, the round mark, you can see that all the names are effectively published. That means it is coming under ICB and other, no, sorry, that uh, any valid publication, the publication manager either electronically or from in the paper or on the paper, it should coming from the, uh, the ISBN number or with the other recognized publication means all the names are effectively published if the wrong name also. But validly published means only the uh, circumscription of our taxonomic entity that should be published, validly published. You should not confuse valid publication and effective publication. These two are different. And finally, name should be legitimate. Legitimate means uh, it is somewhat acceptable from the particular group of taxonomists. That is a legitimate name. It is not, not it's a correct name. Leg all legitimate names are not correct. 
but ultimately the correct name is only one which name is only one name the if applied to the taxa it is acceptable by all the the taxonomies that is only the correct name but legitimate name may be vary from from the correct name the similarly valid name is uh, may be very uh, can uh, it's different from the legitimate name so these are all different so you should understand these things next please you know it governs uh, the icgen uh, cengen code or international code of nomenclature governs two fundamental activities there are functions are very clear one is naming of new taxa so we are giving uh, uh, we are continuously published in new names or uh, new plants or new names for algae fungi bryophyte like that and second thing is determining the correct name for previously named taxa so these two are important functions of the uh, that code the icn or the things we should understand next one you know the how to find the correct name already i told you that so these are the some of the process and the different time it was uh, appeared or modified uh, to modified approach for uh, uh, the uh, uh, de decision on the application of correct name so here one support that was also proposed by mcneil you can see that names in effectively published already it would be effective publication maybe it can publish in any journal that is effective publication nowadays so names in work there are not effectively published means because not printed or not distributed or not uh, are in the thesis so these are all the uh, not effective publication but even though any people they can pub, uh, publish in the electronic media also that is effectively published but validly published name we should be carefully what means names not validly published means because the pre starting date maybe one species published already the same thing we have uh, published in the different name in another journal that is not a valid publication validly prd publication is overruled then validly published name and finally names whose type is preferable to the taxon involved which type we are uh, prefer to the publication of that name of the taxa and name is in accordance with rules either is legitimate we have to follow the rules all the articles is supported for our new name the name of the taxa or not we have to uh, uh, confirm the things and finally earliest name of uh, applicable to the taxon and uh, we have to register and everything our legitimate name finally it should be a correct name excellent please excellent please so effective publication it has covered under the article 29 to 45 so why they have given this many articles for uh, this section means you should know now a lot of spurious publications are the publication of a new name or proposing of new taxa like that the publication is effected under this code by distribution of printed matter through sale exchange or gift to the general public or at least to scientific institution with generally accessible libraries these are the first thing for effective publication the publication is also effected by distribution on or after 1st january priority of publication we have to see on or after 1st january 2012 of electronic material in portable document format pdf format in an online publication with an international standard serial number or an international standard book number so before 2012 it was not accepted but after 2000 january uh, uh, after uh, 2012 january all electronic media publication or pdf uh, format it is acceptable so so many number of good journals are there Uh, for publication of new taxa uh, cubolatin taxon candolia blumia even current science uh, the botanical magazine several things uh, nilambo like there several magazines are there for uh, the publication of new taxa these are only the effective publication next one yeah printed matter limited by date these are all should be followed by prior priority of publication or what date should be considered all these things It's so effectively published before January to 1953, but not after. So indelible autograph, handwritten material reproduced mechanically, such as lithography. So 
So before nine, uh, 1953, it is considerable, even handwritten manuscript. They should have written some in hand on the paper that also we can consider. It mentioned clearly about the tax or Latinization or uh, the type specimen or diagram, everything. This was accepted. And trade catalog, printed matter accompanying specimen, example, printed exicate specimen labels, these are also accepted. But in the date is important before 1953. And dissertation or thesis submitted as a requirement for an academic de degree unless. So it is not a dissertation, but something they have submitted as a report like that. So these are also include on or after, uh, the, uh, but on or after 1958 was not considered, before it was considered. Next one, what are all the rules uh, the, for publication? Uh, uh, next one, next one. Yeah, here, uh, never effectively published even verbal communication. Uh, it's announcement in the conference. I am going to publish. This is a new taxa. Uh, I have uh, discovered like this. It is not a valid publication. Next, placing of names in collections or garden open to the public. So I have cultivated that species. It is a new species. Announcement like that. Even though labeled that species as a new species, it is not effective publication. Issue of microfilm of uh, micro uh, manuscript or typescript or other unpublished material. These are not electronic publication other than the described above. So these are not acceptable. Any electronic publication prior to January 2012, it was not uh, that uh, applied for uh, applicable to the rule. So these are all uh, effective publication or not effective publication. So again, I have given the article, several articles it has mentioned. So next rules on valid publication according to the date. So date is important. You know, first main 1753 uh, for spermatophyta. You know, species plantarum published in first May 1753 by Carolus Linnaeus. So that is the date of, uh, you know, 1753 is a resurrection period for botany. And even uh, the binomial started in the date. After that, only our botany was flourished. So next, so 1753 is important date. Next, no, first May 1753, in combination of author must define definitely associated the final epithet with the name of genus or species or with its abbreviation. The name must be accepted by the author in the original publication. The relative order of rank specified in the code must be followed. So these are all the things it was specified in the species plantarum. So that's why it is a resurrection period for botany or nomenclature of botany. Next one. Uh, again, 1753 reference to the base unim or replaced synonym. So Linnaeus has named for almost all the texts available at the time. So we should check when we are uh, supposed going to propose any taxa, we should check Linnaean name. Must be there in the Linnaean system. In January 1908, for the name of new taxon at generic or lower rank, an illustration with the analysis is no longer acceptable in place of a validating description or diagnosis. This is one important thing. When we are publishing new taxa, uh, it should uh, adhere or affixed with either illustration, it must be their Latin diagnosis. It was decided in 1998 code. And next 1912, the name of new genus may long, uh, no longer coincide with the Latin. Technical term in use in morphology at the time of publication. Such name may be validly published before 1912, provided that it was accompanied by binomial species name. So it has been decided in the 1912. And 1953 to 2011, almost all the decision was taken from the International Botanical Conference are stable. It was not there any major changes, but only 2011, we have the description or Latin diagnosis must be in Latin. Latin and uh, foreign, but the Latin diagnosis may be uh, the Latinization of name is enough, but Latin diagnosis may be in uh, English description. Uh, so that was accepted in December 2011. Next slide, please. Yeah, these are the several things like uh, 1953 and 2011. Uh, uh, it was ordered 2011 only major changes already pointed out. Name of new taxon of all gay except fossils, the validating description or diagnosis must be in Latin. For a name published before 1958, the validating description or diagnosis may, may, in, any, uh, may in different language. So next slide, please. 
yeah similarly the article 38.1 again i want to uh, uh, the point out some of the things in january 2012 Uh, from the melbourne court for the name of new taxon in all groups the validating description or diagnosis must be in either latin or english so if you are giving latin uh, diagnosis also not wrong but english description is enough for publication of new species or new taxa they how uh, it is important decision because now many body are not knowing about the latin diagnosis or latinization so Uh, they have removed from the particular latin diagnosis process at the publication of new taxa so it is governed under by the uh, article 38.1 in order to to be validly published a name of new taxon c article uh, 6.9 also must be accompanied by a description or diagnosis of the taxon and if none is provided the protologue by the reference to a previously and effectively published description or diagnosis so they have very clearly explained in different article and different section also and they have given note also so uh, some of suppose it is uh, confused or many article cited were uh, cited for a uh, same uh, uh, principle or uh, items they have given uh, the note for every the confusable codes they have given the note also with the example also next slide please yeah these are uh, super fluidity already i told you that even uh, without uh, uh, seeing the others publication or priority of uh, publication uh, or prior uh, published taxa so other may published uh, Uh, a new species or new taxa for the already published names so that is called a super close name or homonymy homonymy means same name uh, published by different others for the same species that may be the homonymy so these are the either family names or any rank of taxa many homonymy already it was appeared in taxonomy that's why they have erected these rules the only other circumstance in which the name may be illegitimate if it is the name of family or subdivision of a family based on an illegitimate generic name suppose uh, illegitimate generic name also somewhat sometime it was there for example many families uh, already the rule was there the family name started with the uh, stem of the genera i told already for uh, for example uh, fabaceae there is no faba is not uh, uh, the valid name but fabaceae is there uh, ebanaceae ebanum the, there is no any genus ebanum already it was there but ebanum is a illegitimate name now there is no genus ebanum but is there the ebanaceae is there uh, similarly balsaminaceae uh, balsamina there is no generic name was not there in balsamina well balsaminaceae is there how this a type species only few families they have exception from the rule some that uh, they have given very clearly so like that this uh, it's a ca causes of illegitimacy what are the reason it was there uh, may be proposed to two other botanists at the same time from the same generic name so that may be uh, invalid the homonymy so now removed but some of the family name conserved it against conserve the rule uh, so that's why they have maintained all those families fabaceae uh, but uh, that's uh, banaceae Uh, balsam is here they are maintaining means that may be conserved next please yeah here some a simple example for uh, uh, that homonymy you can see that uh, the, this plant is only the endemic to uh, southern western ghat one of the ixora it's a ixora monticola the gamble uh, gamble already it was uh, named ixora monticola based on the collection you know that uh, right hand corner uh, below that uh, is uh, that collection from uh, uh, blotter from the highway we mountains of tamil nadu has collected based on the sheet herbarium seed gamble named it say xora monticola he proposed in his book uh, flora of metas presidency 1920 and uh, already another one name was there but probably it is the uh, northern india it was collected xora monticola is there but without seeing the gamble name the earlier our gamble was not saying that ixora monticola when he was proposing the name ixora monticola hyren was there it was now it is changed it is a pavata mont it is a, uh, some pavata monticola genus was changed you can see the left hand above corner that was seed was there pavata monticola hyren was collected even pune or somewhere but the specimens are different the names are same 
here homonymy this is called homonymy here uh, heterotypic homonymy two types are different uh, two species are also different but they have put homonymy without seeing one another so gamble was not seeing heron specimen or heron what's uh, because it, it was uh, published very earlier uh, so gamble proposed the hixora monticola 1920 it was there but now rightly it was recognized by kotamuthu he has published the hixora rabicumari that because homonymy we can change the name both the species names are the same but for the different specimen but hixora monticola gamble now is hixora rabicumari it is recently uh, uh, its name changed in 2016 so these are the important things when we are seeing the uh, uh, the publication of new names are earlier published name are when you are finding the correct name of this species next slide please so another homonymy i will explain already i told you that this repigia previtubulata so repigia previtubulata brachistelma previtubulatum both are same here specimen is same because this species uh, uh, so earlier on two species are different specimens are different here same specimen is single the cerberium sheet is single so earlier it was published repigia previtubulata bedom bedom only it was collected that sheet but later gamble has changed the name serapigia to brachistelma and but he followed the basio name previtubulata into previtubulatum brachistelma previtubulatum uh, this is uh, uh, the priority of publication of serapigia previtubulata is correct but brachistelma previtubulatum but his uh, name is different name for uh, single herbarium it is a uh, homotypic uh, synonym or nomenclature synonym a name based on the same type as that of another name in article 14.4 it is indicated by the symbol is like that so when we are writing this we can see the some symbols are also used for writing the synonymy in the appendix of the code terms an adjective synonym in the international code of zoological nomenclature so that is different so these are the homonymy of the species uh, uh, that uh, species next slide please yeah in the world a name also sometimes superfluous name so without seeing the many names are published for the already published taxa that is called a superfluous name a name is nomenclaturally superfluous when a different name should have been used in instead and <coughs> under article 17.5 the superfluous name often has the same type or the same that should have been used for example agapanthus umbellatus it is one of the common ornamental plant in the gardens Uh, the, it was published in 1789, uh, based on the Crinum africanum Linnaeus, 1753. In the species Plantarum, he has published the Crinum africanum. But later, 1789, it was the same species published as Agapanthus sambalatus. So nomenclaturally superfluous because he was not followed the any uh, that a basio name or uh, priority of publication and uh, other things. Now the combination of Agapanthus africanus because Crinum africanum has priority. Crinum africanum is priority. We have to follow. Suppose when the changing of uh, uh, the species to one species to other genus, we have to follow the base unim. So now Agapanthus africanus is a valid name. Next slide, please. Yeah, a, a lot of things. Uh, the causes of illeg illegitimacy. So illegitimate name may be causes in several uh, reasons because uh, uh, we are not following or we are not adhere the rules of priority or uh, not followed the uh, the priority of publications uh, or not checking properly the correct name. So it is it may cause the the illegitimacy of name. It is a para homo ni misal may be also may be appear in several places. For example, the spelling. I already the orthography on uh, provision or article was there in orthography. You can see Bradley Adams. No, Bradley. Bradley is a man uh, who was uh, honored with the different many number of uh, species. Now Bradley. Uh, the, you can see the spelling. Next only Bradley. Ja. This uh, different species. But you can see the Bradley and double D is there. Or, or, or is the spelling is different in the. But all the three are. Uh, Uh, different species are different species, but different names for different taxa. But the spelling you can see. But this may cause also illegitimacy. Suppose uh, illegitimacy. This may cause also illegitimacy. When we are uh, uh, the naming of taxa, we should be very careful for uh, uh, that spelling, orthography, and the endings of uh, uh, endings of the rank. That must be uh, followed very carefully. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, these are the several, I told you that uh, they listed out several uh, problem for superfluidity and uh, superfluidity one, a name unless conserved or sanctioned is illegitimate and is to be rejected. If it was nomenclaturally superfluous, then published. So that is caused to superfluidity. And next one, the essential relevant article of the code said that in all cases citing as a synonym, as a name, uh, the, that ought to have been adopted create superfluidity. You know, sometimes it has been many, many names for a single taxa that may cause the superfluidity. So every region, they may follow only particular uh, literature. So they can have uh, its own uh, valid name. So that is also cause superfluidity. Next slide, please. Yeah, it's not there. Is there any problem? Sir, two minutes, sir, they are figuring okay. out. Okay, okay. Again, I'm back. I hope we can start the session. Resume yeah, session. thank you. Thank you. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Yeah, next slide. Go to next. Yeah, now uh, you know that uh, the, all these things are caused by superfluidity. Now, the, the uh, finding correct name uh, is very important task. So now it has, so uh, earlier I showed the same slide, but slightly changed now how to find the, uh, the you know, correct space, uh, correct taxa, correct taxa. So all the names are apparently legitimate names. When we are seeing any name of the taxa or any botanical name, any rank of the botanical name or it is valid name, we can say that it's a valid name or a legitimate name also. But how to find the correct name? That is, now it is a very critical task. So we have to follow the rules very strictly, all the parts and the sections and the divisions, uh, chapters uh, and the recommendations. Then only we can find the correct name with a, with a, uh, a right way of the process of 
finding. No, names in effectively published. Every name is published effectively and validly published name. I shown the previous slide that was in red color. So every names are valid. Now it is validly published. Very simply, we can publish it. It has come on paper or in the media or in electronic media. It has come in the PDF document, portable document means it is also validly published uh, with some numbers. So name whose type is referable to the taxon involved. And that is important. The type must be mentioned in the protologue or the, in the manuscript. Name in accordance with the rules. So it should be strictly follow or adhere to the rules or our ICBN rules, uh, the ICN, that engine code we have to follow very strictly for uh, uh, that nomenclature, ending of tax or ranking of tax and everything. And uh, even though earliest name applicable to the taxon is given circumscription, rank and position. So now it is, that's why many names are changed now. All old names become as a valid name now. You can see, uh, so now we are, we are checking, uh, the, many people are asking, why are taxonomy changing the names uh, very often? They will ask very simply. But you know, now many uh, changes are there for a single taxa and their name, but even though now is the rule is to prefer the oldest name is a valid name. It is validly published or in the particular circumscription. So they how we, we how to find the name is like that. So this flowchart is somewhat changes is recently by McNeil is modified. Next slide, please. You know, the uh, several parameters are there when we are reading the rule or code. It is, uh, uh, the code is controlled by taxonomy that influence uh, uh, correctness of the name. Only we how to be uh, the corrected the names uh, and the taxonomic ranks and everything only because of the code. Now the correct name versus synonym. Maybe one name. Sorry, and excuse so me. Many synonyms are there, and, and finally the uh, that uh, plants used to denote placement of taxon relative to other. Even uh, several examples are there. So even author names are synonymous to come. And plant names are uh, come, several others may be named for a single species, or single species may be uh, differently named for several other like that. So these are the four major ways that names are changed. Oh, they have why they are changed. Sir, four excuse major, me. Sir. Yeah, please. Uh, can you move a little faster, sir? Because okay, next okay. speaker just, is. Just right. I'm going to. Okay, okay. Sorry, sir. Thank you. Okay, no problem. So only four changes of uh, major changes in the name. United, divided, change in the rank, change in the position. You can see the example. Next, go to it. Next one. So names united. You can see there, Preria Indica. Previously, it was uh, uh, that uh, uh, before one. So Preria Indica, that was a valid name. It is accepted by all the taxonomy. It's a monotypic genera in India. It's a, a, a endemic to the Pune God. Uh, it is now transferred to Pausrosia Freeri. So now rank is uh, uh, rank is merged. Freeria is a genus. It is merged with other geni geni genera Pausrosia. It is a merged or it is united. Next, you can see Tylophora. In India, we have more than 40 species of Tylophora. Now there is no more Tylophora, the genus Tylophora in India. All the Tylophora is merged with the Vincitaxicum. Now Tylophora indica, is a vincitaxicum indicum. And similarly, sarcostemma. Previously, you can see the left hand corner. That is morphologically, uh, it's a different one. And now, sarcostemma is um, synonym of synanthum. Like that, rank may be divided. You can see the rank used to the relative position of the taxon, taxonomic hierarchy we have to follow. You can see the Carloma ascendance variety geniculata was first published by Gravel in Moir Northern. Later, uh, variety geniculata go to the, the uh, species level. It is erected to the species Carluma geniculata directly by Niven Light. Now it is a vegetative name, but even though these are uh, not followed by the basio name, Serapigia geniculata also published, Serapigia murugani also published. Serapigia murugani is a super close name. Now it's a already valid name is there, Carluma geniculata. Next one. So name for divided. Some names are divided, you can see Cleom. We can see the first row of plants. You can see these are all cleome previously. Now, the first yellow color group is a cleome, second one is Corinandra, and third one is Cleocerata. All are divided. 
based on some uh, uh, the opinion of taxonomists. It is acceptable by the accepted by the taxonomists. So they have been divided. And uh, next to also Caraluma, it is exactly divided into 17 subgenus by Robert Blouse. Uh, so now it is Indian Caraluma into three sections. Caraluma, it's a standard one. And next one, uh, uh, the Caraluma, and like that, Blouse Rosia. Now family is united, different. Malvesia, uh, previously Malvesia, Stetlesia, Tiliesia, Bombacasia, these are all different families. But now all is merged with Malvesia. Even some more families also merged with Malvesia. Uh, it's going to be held. And the two reasons for changing of names. One is names contrary to the rules are legitimate name. And second reason is additional researchers have changed the definition and delimitation of tax. Are these two reasons? Uh, so very often we are changing the names. Next one, the hybrid names. You know, this is a special uh, section was there for naming the hybrids. So whenever we are writing hybrids, we can do the cross mark in between the genus and species. Or uh, in between the species like that, the system was suggested to write how to write the hybrid names. These are all several quotes, even 12 uh, articles, it has been uh, only for the name of hybrids. Next one. Next one. Yeah, now it's a name for conservation. Already it told you the conservation, rejection, and binding decisions. These are the last uh, section of the Sengen code. Next one. Next one. Yeah, see next, it's a conservation. It is, uh, the conservation may be the different rank. It is concerned with the rank of family or rank of genera or rank of uh, species are same as the rejected also, rejection of family. So conservation at regicienta for it is meant for all the things already I uh, uh, pointed out in the, the outline of the sentient code. So next. Go to next. Yeah, these are some examples. You can see the, uh, uh, so I put one plant, so now it is Corridalis. So it is against conserve uh, some of the uh, name against the uh, against the reason name. So reason name, several things are proposed, but it is, uh, now it's conserved. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So next slide, please. Directly, you can go to the binding uh, decision binding of this engine code. Or sometimes we can change this code also. Already it's what code, but one section provisions are there. We can propose something and uh, uh, we can propose or with a, uh, a specific article, uh, so we can change the code also. So we have to write the proposal to the uh, the taxon, the committees, permanent nomenclature committee is there. They will look after our proposal and they will next, uh, inter uh, International Botanical Congress, they will be discussed the proposal. And if it is acceptable and voted the other institution or the committee, the, our proposal may be accepted. The courts are not permanent. The courts may be changeable, but even we have to propose uh, in the right manner, we can get the, the changes of the code also. Yeah, yeah, it's a rejection. Yeah, several names are rejected because uh, uh, it was uh, superfluidity and many reasons are there or it was not published properly. The many names are rejected. Uh, so rejection, uh, it is also there. Next, they will put the, the symbol REG means rejection. Regis and them. This next, next. Or directly go to con uh, conclusion. Concludes the suppressed work. Already I told you, opera predicts the binding decision. Yes, this is important. And the glossary, I already told you that every word they have clearly spelled out. And yeah, finally, conclusion. Every floristic, monographic, and divisionary studies are important aspect of taxonomy and involves formidable exercise of nomenclature. Taxonomy and nomenclature are undoubtedly independent, but complement each other to make studies complete and scientific. The nomenclature is the process of determining the correct names for units according to code, the rules framed by international community for uniformity, universal accept applicability, and stability. The nomenclature is a mechanism for 
unambiguous communication about the elements of taxonomy. The nomenclature aims for one correct name, that is an identifier for each taxonomic group, that's a taxon refers to any one element in taxonomic rank. Uh, it is the word, the taxonomy will have only one correct name, that is the aim of the code. So every code has tried to give the, the very precise correct name for each and every taxon. So these are all the uh, these are all the things governed only by the ICN or International uh, uh, Code of Nomenclature you now for algae, uh, uh, fungi, and plants. Thank you, thank you, one and all. If you have any doubt and queries, I have given my mail in the last uh, the, my slide, and you can mail me or you can ask me. No problem. Thank you for uh, organizer to giving me the platform to share knowledge on uh, sentient code. I think uh, uh, some of the interruptions are there because of it has happened. But even though I'm very happy to uh, be there uh, and meet you all in this uh, the webinar, uh, happy. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you once again for uh, organizer, particularly Dr. Vijay Bhaskar. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much uh, uh, for your wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, it's a great day for us, great morning for us uh, to have a wonderful speaker like you. And many of participants are enriched with the uh, knowledge of uh, uh, nomenclature, particularly on uh, uh, Shenzhen code. So as a uh, formal vote of thanks, uh, uh, now I request uh, Dr. Nageshwara Amanchi to propose a vote of thanks. Yeah, uh, good morning all of you. Uh, thank you very much, sir, on behalf of the organizing committee of the uh, one big outcome course on plant taxonomy and on my personal behalf and from the participant side i uh, i am very much <coughs> you uh, you have enlightened your entire team and all the participants uh, we have been uh, watching so many uh, uh, responses in the chat box it is very good um, presentation very neat collaborative exhaustive very very informative and definitely it is going to uh, help our all participants, especially budding taxonomics in the botany. It is very, very uh, down to earth presentation, very informative presentation, sir. Uh, we, request, uh, to, uh, we request from the participant side, if somebody makes any mail, mail any question, they raise it, please respond to their queries. They also will be in touch with you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Jay please. Thank you, Dr. Amanchi. Yeah. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are yeah. audible. Thank you, Dr. Amanchi. Uh, uh, many participants are. In Yes, go ahead. <coughs> sir, you can continue. You can continue, sir. You are audible. Hello. Good afternoon. Sir, Vijay Bhaskar ready, sir. Yeah, uh, maybe there is a technical uh, ah, issue. Okay, sir. Uh, then uh, issue. Uh, shall I introduce? Uh, we'll, uh, yeah, yeah, please. You invite this up, madam. Uh, so, good morning all. Uh, I am Dr. D. Shashikala, uh, Department of Environmental Science, Usmania University. I took the privilege uh, to introduce today's eminent speaker, uh, Dr. C. Sudhakar Reddy, sir. He is a scientist SF, Head uh, Forest Biodiversity and Ecology uh, Division, uh, NRAC, Hyderabad. Uh, his education qualifications are uh, he finished his uh, uh, Master's of Science uh, in Botany from Osmania University and he completed his PhD from uh, Kakatiya University in Botany uh, subject. Uh, his uh, research experience is 24 years and his specialized areas are uh, remote sensing, GIS, taxonomy, forest ecology, biodiversity, uh, etc. Uh, to his uh, crown, he has been awarded uh, with so many awards and recognition. Out of them, few are listed here. Uh, he got, uh, or he received uh, 
ஹரி ஓம் அஸ்ரம் பிரேரித் டாக்டர் விக்ரம் சாராபாய் ரீசர்ச் அவார்ட் இன் டூ தௌசண்ட் செவன்டீன் ஃப்ரம் டிபார்ட்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் ஸ்பேஸ் கவர்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் இந்தியா ஹி வாஸ் அனௌன்ஸ்ட் ஆஸ் டிஸ்டிங்விஷ்ட் அலம்னி இன் டூ தௌசண்ட் எயிட்டீன் ஃப்ரம் காக்கதே யூனிவர்சிட்டி தெலங்கானா ஹெல்த் ஆஃப் இந்தியா ஹி ஆல்சோ ரிசீவ்ட் ப்ரொஃபஸர் எம்பி ரியாசாதா மெடல் அவார்ட் இன் டூ தௌசண்ட் சிக்ஸ்டீன் ஃப்ரம் அசோசியேஷன் ஃபார் பிளான்ட் டாக்ஸானமி இந்தியா ஆம் ஐ ஆடிபிள் எஸ் சார் Uh, he also received uh, professor uh, pr uh, pisharati memorial award uh, in 2014 indian society of remote sensing uh, sensing and he also received dr sk jain medal award in 2010 from association for plant taxonomy india mm, uh, uh, he also awarded uh, city strategy uh, strategist award 2009 Uh, from foundation for uh, futuristic cities hyderabad he is uh, also awarded uh, isro young scientist merit award in 2008 from the department of space government of india he is a fellow of indian botanical society awarded in 2012 and uh, in 2011 he also awarded a fellow of indian association for angiosperm taxonomy india Uh, he also awarded uh, in 2008 uh, fellow of association for uh, plant taxonomy india he is uh, uh, he has got so many memberships in technical teams out of them few are listed here uh, he is a member of expert committee on invasive avian species national biodiversity authority he is a member Uh, in working group of uh, indian himalayas uh, niti ayog government of india he is member uh, in uh, board of studies in environmental sciences ismania university and department of botany andhra university in department of botany kakatiya university in department of botany telangana university and uh, department of environmental studies kochi university he is executive uh, council member in association for plant taxonomy india he is expert member telangana state biodiversity board uh, he is uh, editor of journal uh, of uh, economics and taxonomic botany he has published uh, so many books and research publications he published 14 books and 261 uh, research papers Uh, his uh, citations uh, are uh, 3950 he guided nearly uh, 49 different students in uh, phd's for for their phd's mphil mtec and msc he uh, gave nearly 90 uh, such invited extensive lectures so uh, these are a very few these are very few to uh, his uh, uh, crown Uh, i have given very uh, short cut of uh, his uh, uh, bio sketch and now i'll invite uh, our uh, today's eminent speaker uh, dr sudhakar reddy garu to continue the session Hello. thank Hello. you sir thank you very much sir ah uh-huh, start in the and the presentation gale kandu venu yeshwar sir would you please mute your mic hello i am audible sir uh, sir Uh, you can start sir thank you sir am i audible yes, yes sir sudakar sir, sir. Yes, sir. audible sir yeah presentation i have to share or you are sharing you need to screen share the presentation sir sir if uh, you can share uh, please try to share sir otherwise uh, we will try sir sudakar sir if you are uh, able to share then it is okay sir otherwise we will share sir yeah yeah i am trying Okay sir. Okay sir. Sir I got your PPT sir but it is in yeah. uh, Google uh, presentation. So yes. if you want me share I I can share sir. Yeah you may share please. Yeah, you mentioned the PPT. Sir, it will be in this mode, sir. Yeah. 
can you zoom? I I cannot zoom, sir. Uh, th th this is uh, what I can show. It is okay, or I share my one. So it is. If it okay, is possible, sir? you share, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. It is good yeah. now. Now it is good, sir. Please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now it is good, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. My pleasure to present on the remote sensing applications of the biodiversity. So, thank you very much, Dr. Shishkala Madam and Dr. Jibhav Skaradi for this opportunity and introducing my biodata to the participants. Yes, sir, your audio is not clear, sir. Please. It is, it is audible now? Audible but not clear, sir. Sir, it is audible but not uh, in low voice, sir. Hello. It is in low voice. Hello. It is in low voice, sir. Voice. Your voice sir, can is you be a little voice. louder, sir? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Now, it is, now it is okay. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. I am yeah. presenting on the remote sensing applications for biodiversity. The why we are more focusing on biodiversity and the studies related to taxonomy ecology and so on. The mainly the earth is experiencing a global climate change. It is threatening the very survival of the humankind. As listed by the Google search, the, what are the major environmental issues for the planet? There are five. A biodiversity conservation, water resources management, controlling of deforestation, controlling of pollution and mitigation of climate change. If you see all the five environmental issues, they are revolving around a green leaf. It means if you protect, if you conserve the forest, if you conserve the trees, we can able to mitigate majority of the environmental, environmental issues and we can able to sustain and we can able to man, manage the resources for future generations. As being a multidisciplinary in nature, the biodiversity is a multidisciplinary science. It draws its foundations from the taxonomy and ecology. And further, there is a lot of development, development in the technology side. So now, the integration of taxonomical data, ecological data, and remote sensing, it helps in addressing the various questions related to biodiversity that what, where, and how biodiversity is distributed and how biodiversity is changing across the time. And if you see that in the 1986 itself, the United Nations identified the remote sensing role in conservation of the environment. It should protect the earth natural environment and it should protect mankind from the natural disasters. And see that what is this remote sensing? The remote sensing is a state of what technology? It is for a layman definition, it is an eye in the sky. Here, for like, for example, in our taxonomical studies, we will go to the field and we will collect the information uh, like herbarium specimen collection and we will do the identification in a, physically. Whereas in the remote sensing, 
we are getting the information of the object or the earth surface without actually being in contact with it so we are deriving a, in the information mainly through the electromagnetic spectrum the principles of electromagnetic energy so there the different kind of the objects like trees shrubs herbs water body agricultural field barren land rocky area hill mountain ocean all are having a different kind of the physical properties so the if you see this spectral reflectance curve it is a typical healthy vegetation uh, reflectance curve that how the vegetation is showing the reflectance values in the different regions of electromagnetic spectrum like in visible there is a high reflectance in the green band so we are seeing vegetation in green color but apart from the green visible region there is a high reflectance of the healthy vegetation in near infrared region so in the near infrared region the vegetation discrimination is very much possible like to discriminate the different vegetation types and communities and similarly the short wave infrared also because of its peculiar nature of the water absorption we can able to make use of the short wave infrared region to for discrimination of like evergreen vegetation and the dry vegetation so for identifying the different features like the forest level to the tree level we we, we can make use of the satellite remote sensing or the re remote sensing using aircrafts or remote sensing using drones so still there is a question that why we need to use remote sensing observations or remote sensing data so just i am giving a, a clarity on that that the way we need to use the in situ observations of taxonomy and ecology and also the remote sensing if you see this in situ observations for example in the ecological studies we will go for some kind of sampling it may be random sampling or systematic sampling or stratified sampling but we will cover only the few pockets of the study area similarly in our floristic studies we are not covering the entire study area while we are collecting the plant specimens or the uh, while enumerating the species we are only visiting only few places and based on the few places information we are giving a detailed information of the study area so even though information is based uh, depending on the sparse locations the we are having full details of the species description and its location whereas the remote sensing observations are global in nature they provide the detailed information on day to day basis even because of the technological development even we can see the earth in more than four times in a day by using different sensor system so even though it is a spatially coarse we can able to identify the habitat condition habitat status habitat improvement habitat degradation and further there is a lot of development in the sensor technology now we are having the sensors which can identify the with the better resolution of centimeter level and the meter level so even we can make use of the remote sensing for identification of species and the identification of the plant communities even we can make use of this the data from remote sensing to identify the gap areas i will show in the uh, one of the slide we can make use of this remote sensing based information for for a better sampling strategy and we can make use of this remote sensing for tracking of the international biodiversity targets so by combining the taxonomical information phytosociological information and upscaling of this taxonomical and phytosociological information from local level to global level we can able to assess the change in the biodiversity so the role of remote sensing became a very indispensable and all the global experts now identified that the remote sensing as one of the main tool for addressing the biodiversity change so here i am showing in a simpler way that the applications of the remote sensing what exactly we are getting here is the vertical distribution of tree forest and land cover and also the horizontal distribution of the uh, these features so from this information of the different individual species forest and land cover we can make use of the information on <clears throat> species identification by using the different kinds of spectral signatures in electromagnetic spectrum we are having optical data we are having microwave data we are having the thermal data so even lidar data for making use of in identification and classification so we can use this information to develop a database on forest types communities and we can 
also develop information on the vegetation canopy density in a given point of time and we can able to assess the vegetation stand structure three dimensional variables and we can able to assess the vegetation health on daily basis and the habitat condition habitat suitable detection of the habitats so here the currently the global standing biomass carbon pools and fluxes and we can uh, link this uh, daily data of remote sensing that is available from 1972 onwards so all more than four decades data is available so we can able to assess the vegetation phenology we can able to assess the changing pattern of vegetation like degradation habitat fragmentation the impact of fire on vegetation the uh, increasing threat of the invasive alien species habitat characterization and we can make use of this data on ecosystem services and so on so then uh, recently the global expert community it is known as geoban global earth observation network community under the uh, uh, convention on biological diversity they identified that there is a novel they identified a very novel concept of essential biodiversity variables earlier the taxonomists are doing exploration the ecologists are doing the quantification of the diversity the remote sensing persons are doing only the mapping of forest types and the vegetation uh, canopy density but uh, this individual elements may not give the sufficient information so the this novel concept of essential biodiversity variable says that we have to when you are doing any study related to biodiversity we have to consider that the studying of the taxonomic diversity like species level to family level or so on, and phylogeny and we need to also study the land cover and land cover change and land cover distribution vegetation canopy structure and height habitat fragmentation and its variation phenology and changing patterns of biomass and the disturbances like forest fires and the specific characteristics like the plant functional types and plant functional traits and the species occurrence and the distribution information and the species abundance information like the population status so if you are doing the research when you are doing a biodiversity research it is complete when you are integrating all these parameters in your study otherwise it will give you only the incomplete information on the biodiversity status and the biodiversity conservation purpose then here here on what i am showing the main applications of the remote sensing the remote sensing became very popular because of the forest cover assessment and also change assessment so the change assessment generally includes both afforestation and the deforestation the deforestation rate is very high as compared with the afforestation so in the central portion i am showing one satellite imagery in the green color composite it is known as a natural color composite so you are seeing all the trees and the other vegetation in a green color and the and the remaining color here color indicates the non forest whereas in the background i am showing one field photograph of one side it is showing the forest other side there is a deforestation then how circuit images observes the change so here the each pixel is like a one location it is having the different kinds of the digital numbers that each digital number indicates the spectral reflectance, reflectance pattern of the tree or a shrub or a herb or maybe a grass or any other land cover so if there is any change in the pixel response that indicates there is some change it may be negative change or a positive change so here i am showing the four images in the top i am showing the part of image of the sonitpur district of assam the the first left hand side the top one is the 1975 satellite imagery for part of sonitpur district and for the same area if you see in 2013 there is a drastic change in the color actually this here the red is indicates the forest vegetation I, earlier i said that in the near infrared the vegetation reflectance values are very high so we, so by using the near infrared we can able to discriminate the dense vegetation open vegetation agricultural vegetation grassland other and other classes so in the 1975 and 2013 more than 90% of the loss of forest cover is appearing in this given image chip similarly if you see the the bottom one the 1975 and 2013 images for the navarangpur district in orissa the 1975 more than 90% of the area is covered by forest and by 2013 the majority of the forest is converted to agriculture or the barren land 
So what we are doing at NRSC, National Remote Sensing Center, is that we are making a national database for the entire country, and at the same time, the Forest Survey of India is now from 1989 onwards. They are also generating the biannual forest cover maps and biannual forest cover reports, and they are submitting to the Parliament for the authorization. So, but in NRSC, we are mainly focusing on the natural forest change, and so we developed the forest cover maps for. the different time periods mainly from like 1930 in the 1930 we don't have any satellite remote sensing so we have used the forest cover information available from the survey of india topographical maps done by at that time then from 1975 onwards we are having the satellite remote sensing so we are mapping the forest cover on periodically then for the 1880 there is no any data like the survey of india maps or the satellite images based on the trend analysis in the geographical information system we have modeled the forest cover it means we have predicted the forest cover for the past like 1880 then coming to the telangana state that if you see here there is a huge there is a large amount of forest cover distributed in 1930 and 1960 and after the 1960s there are huge development for infrastructure development like road development railway network and the agricultural sector also huge there is a huge development so the majority of the forests have witnessed the large scale deforestation for the like majority of the areas are converted from forest to crop field or agriculture so if you see the area estimate also like in 1930 the state is having 40746 square kilometers of forest it means it is 36% of the geographical area of forest now we are having, having only the 15 around 15% of geographic area is under forest in telangana and to support the decision management by the state forest departments and also to use by the researchers and scientists we are hosting this data of 1930 to 2013 in the our one web portal by the isro that is bhuvan.nrsc.gov.in whoever is interested for this data and whoever is interested to know the what kind of changes happened in their own study areas in the district level or state level or in the wildlife sanctuary they can make use of this data to understand the or to quantify the changes in the forest so similarly here i am showing one analysis of long term forest cover change and we have not only done the exercise for the country and we also expanded it to the neighboring south asian countries so if you see here the analysis in the map i am highlighting both the areas the forest loss areas and also the areas of forest gain the forest gain is very limited as compared with the forest loss and i am also showing the areas which are not affected by any kind of deforestation in the south asia so if you see the overall uh, change the loss is accounted for the like if you see like nepal the 48% of forest cover depletion in nepal 39% in bangladesh and if you see in uh india it is 28% it doesn't mean that india is having less uh, loss of forest cover so here i considered the forest cover with re reference to the total geographical area of that country so overall the india has uh, witnessed more deforestation as compared with the other countries and further what is the use of the this kind of databases in 2010 uh, you know that the ig biodiversity targets 2010 to 2020 so the the mandate of the ig biodiversity targets is that we have to control the deforestation and the degradation so every country including india is a signatory for convention on biological diversity and what is the evidence that the india has really protected or conserved the forest so the databases from the remote sensing the remote sensing satellite imagery is provide us the near real time information so based on that uh, data we can able to generate the status of forest cover so in this uh, slide i am highlighting the uh, annual rate of deforestation based on of the available data so if you see here all the countries in the 1930 to 1975 have undergone a large scale deforestation except the bhutan and afghanistan but once if you see the graph for 2005 to 2014 the there is a clear declining trend of the rate of deforestation it means almost we achieved the target of the ig biodiversity target in controlling the rate of deforestation 
However, there are two countries like Myanmar and Bangladesh. There is a, a increasing kind of the rate of deforestation is happening. So this will give an uh, information to the global uh, scientific community and also the policy makers to uh, prioritize the Bangladesh and Myanmar for further conservation efforts. Then the second application of remote sensing is that the mapping of vegetation types and the land cover. We are we know that the India is a mega biodiversity country, so we need, we don't have a very primary database on the distribution of vegetation types. And if you do through the conventional methods like floristic studies and phytosociological studies, it takes many years to make the precise assessment of the or distribution of the forest types in India. So the remote sensing by integrating the principles of the ecology and principles of biology, and we can able to identify the different vegetation types in India. So we are we are not only we are getting the spectral information for discrimination of vegetation types, not only the phenological information, we are also getting the information on climate, topography from the remote sensing. So here this is the our work published in Environmental Monitoring and Assessment in uh, 2015. It shows that the distribution of forest types and the different land cover types in the country. And further, I selected the Telangana. Here I am showing the distribution of the forest types for Telangana. So the majority of the uh, forest or the predominant forest type in Telangana is the dry deciduous forest. We are having only the moisture deciduous forests only in the high elevation areas where the rainfall is relatively high. So similarly, if you see the vegetation type map of India, the predominant forest type in India also, the dry deciduous forest is the predominant type followed by the moist deciduous forest. Whereas the vetiverian forest is specifically found in like Western Ghats, Himalaya, Northeast India, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Then one more application at the tree level or the community level. So if you are having like a field data at like 0.1 hectare plot or 1 hectare plot, you know that this many number of species are available in a given place. But here generally they are the actual species on the ground. Whereas in the remote sensing, since there is no any physical sensing, it is remotely captured information. So we are not saying them as a actual species, they are known as a spectral species. So if you relate with the same area and uh, we can able to ass assess the diversity within the community and within the community we can able to correlate that the number of species on the ground are like diversity like the Shannon weed index like if you get for a given area like 2.5 uh, Shannon weed index it is an indicator of the biodiversity for a similar place we can able to correlate with the remote sensing data of high resolution to compare the not only diversity and also we can able to identify the biodiversity rich areas by using the spectral information from the satellite data. Then one more the development in the remote sensing is that the use of the new technology of the LIDAR, light detection and ranging. In the earlier databases, we are having like two dimensional information. There is no possibility for the three dimensional information. So here the LIDAR data because of its very high resolution properties and because of the LIDAR beam, we can make use of this information to even estimate the tree volume, tree crown width, tree canopy height and the total tree height. And also we can able to assess the shrub layer, middle story, top story. So the overall the uh, topographical height of the uh, given area and also the tree height and further we can able to make use of this information in identification of the species. It is not only for discrimination of species, we can able to assess the uh, almost precise biomass estimation by using this data. Then another application highlighting here is that the trees outside forest. We give, generally we give the highest priority for the forest because it is having or holding more than 90% of the species diversity. If, however, the tree outside forest may not be biodiversity rich, but they are fulfilling the requirements of the rural economy and they are supporting the livelihoods of the rural people and ethnic people. So if you see like the custard apple, the beauty of monosperma, 
arborescens flabellifer phoenix silvestris they may not be always found in forest the majority of the times we see them tree as a tree outside forest maybe in agricultural areas maybe in shrublands or maybe scattered in the grasslands so thus if you have the knowledge of taxonomy if you conduct a census we can able to make a very good database on the distribution of tree species which are found outside the forest so this is one case study we did in mahbubad area so within a uh, 600 km of sorry within a 600 meters stretch we found more than 10 species like ficus religiosa holoptila integrifolia tamarinda syndica samania summon sapindus tectona borassus flabellifer so here we can say that even though it is a, it is a rural ecosystem it is supporting mixed number mixed type of diversity and this type of species also help the rural economy and also we can make use of the species for different kinds of economic purposes so uh, once if you are having a first hand information on the uh, tree census and the distribution of species we can uh, recommend to the uh, forest department to go for uh, native species plantation instead of the monoculture from the exotics then one more important application related to wildlife and the uh, native biodiversity is that the assessment of the fragmentation we know that the once we are, when you are like going through the national highway or in the forest roads the majority of the roads uh, along the edges like the fringes of the road or the fringe of the forest is not having the enough native diversity it is mostly occupied by the invasive alien species which are popularly known as weeds so if you visit any part of the country all the areas nearby the road or nearby agricultural fringe to forest you find majority of the species are dominated by the invasive species so because of the microclimatic changes in the fringes it doesn't support the native species it gives a canopy gaps or it supports the invasive species but once this invasive species are established they for grow and expand further to the interior forest and they replace the native biodiversity then one more uh, application how we can visualize is that this is the information we can make use of for development of the wildlife corridors and development of a forest and we can also make use of this fragmentation maps for restoration of forest for example if you see in the 1930 this is the one part nearby the sikkim in 1930 the majority of the forest is a large core forest large core forest means it is away from the anthropogenic disturbances while by 2014 for the same area if you see there is a complete loss of the large core forest it means it is clearly affects the movement of the populations and also the uh, long term management of the biodiversity and one more issue is the that due to the habitat fragmentation is that the wildlife and human conflict so once if you build a corridors by linking the remaining patches at least we can able to minimize the wildlife and human conflict and also we can able to minimize the damage ca causing or caused by the invasive species here the other application of the remote sensing it is also very popular like the deforestation assessment through remote sensing the forest fire and forest burnt area assessment we know that the majority of the forests in india are deciduous in nature so they are very much vulnerable to the forest fires even though they are anthropogenic human induced fires they are having their own impact on the regeneration and the understory vegetation if you see here it is not only affecting the uh, local biodiversity and it is also causing the huge it is also uh, responsible for the lot amount of greenhouse gases so it is directly affecting the climate so then we did one study using the indian remote sensing data and we have made a map of the distribution of forest burnt area across the districts of india so if you see this map very clearly like there is a huge forest burnt area in telangana andhra pradesh and orissa at the district level like dadilabad khammam warangal mahabubnagar there have witnessed the more fire affected area as compared with the other districts so overall at the country level 
द ओडिशा आंध्र प्रदेश महाराष्ट्र छत्तीसगढ़ तमिलनाडु मध्य प्रदेश एंड तेलंगाना आर अफेक्टेड बाय द मोर अमाउंट ऑफ द हाई नंबर ऑफ फॉरेस्ट फायर्स सो दिस विल गिव ए स्ट्रेटजिक और वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इनपुट टू द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया टू प्रायोरिटाइज द कंजर्वेशन एफर्ट्स देन द अर्लीर इंफॉर्मेशन इज गुड दैट आफ्टर द बंट एरिया वी हैव मैप्ड द हाउ मच एक्सटेंड इज अफेक्टेड बाय द फायर बट दैट मे नॉट बी सफिशिएंट टू टेक द near real time near real time conservation measures so the uh, national remodeling center as well as forest survey of india has initiated a joint activity of providing the information on near real time so if you see this map this is we can able to provide the near real time forest fire incidents information to the forest beat guards range officers and the conservation conservator of forest dfo whoever is within their uh, jurisdiction we are providing this information daily four times to the state all the state forest departments in india with the collaboration of forest survey of india so this database is useful to stop the or control the forest fires and this database also useful to assess the ecological damage happened to the forest and this database also helpful to the taxonomist to know that the is there any threat to the endemic species or endangered species due to the forest fires then the remote sensing data by using the uh, geographic information system we can able to identify the areas which are uh, affected single time two times three times and more than like 10 times so this map of south asia clearly shows that the areas which have affected all the 15 years are mostly in northeast india and also in andhra pradesh and telangana so this kind of information is very much useful to the not only for the research community and also to the conservation resource managers to take the appropriate steps in controlling the and strengthening the fire management activities <clears throat> so here i am showing the information for the telangana state so how much area is affected by forest fires in telangana so this is the assessment for the almost one decade period from 2005 to 2014 it shows clearly that the 59% of the forest cover is affected by forest fires so this is a very huge impact on the native biodiversity then we by applying the uh, iucn conservation principles and uh, by applying the uh, rodriguez et al uh, principles for uh, conserving the species so and ecology uh, so ecosystems i applied the similar categories which are applicable to species we applied for the forest ecosystems here habitat loss is a like forest loss so if i apply those criteria of iucn red listing for ecosystems now we, we can able to see here in telangana the almost the 25% of the ecosystems became extinct it means there the almost the ent entire forest is converted to agriculture or grassland or water body or other land use so there is no uh, chance for the native species to grow so if you sim similarly if you see that the critically endangered ecosystems here the habitat loss is more than 80% the endangered is refers to the forest losses more than 50% vulnerable is the vulnerable ecosystems means there is a more than 30% of the deforestation or more than 30% of forest loss happened in those areas so now we can able to identify the areas which are not affected like if you see that hardly less than 5% of the area is not affected by any kind of disturbances or any kind of the habitat fragmentation so this kind of maps helps to the helpful to the state forest department to identify the areas which are under risk so once you protect the ecosystems which are under risk so directly it helps to the biodiversity protection then not only for identifying the ecosystems under threat we can able to identify the eco species under threat like in the red book of indian plants you know that there are over around 1200 species were listed but out of this uh, 1200 around 56% are categorized under data deficient status it means we don't have enough quantitative data or enough scientific data to prove the threat status of the 56% of species so by considering that deficiency we undertook one study with the support of 
botanical survey of india jodhpur circle so we done the survey of entire rajasthan and we found that the comifera white is one of the uh, data deficient species in rajasthan so we found that species is uh, only distributed in 26 locations in rajasthan and there are few patches of uh, comifera white also found in gujarat but hardly it supports the 10% of comifera white population so around 90% of this population is only found in rajasthan and distributed across the 26 locations so now by using the vegetation type information we identified that the the total area the total extent of occurrence of comifera white is less than 5000 square kilometer because mostly it grow in thorn forest thorn scrub and little bit in grassland areas and that habitat available for comifera white is less than 5000 square kilometer so based on that we can say it is a endangered species okay for that if you consider the area of occupancy i said that it is only found only in 26 locations so once we quantified the total patch area a total fragmented area of this 26 locations the the total area is quantified as less than 500 square kilometer so based on that uh, principle also we can say it is endangered and further we consulted the state forest department reports they also reported that the declining of populations based on the availability of the gum it is a gum resin google so they said that in the last 20 years the, the there is a drastic reduction in collection of the gum it is the reduction is more than 50% so we can able to indirectly we can say that there is a uh, population has declined like more than 50% so we can use the remote sensing data ground measurements we can integrate the both the field information with the help of remote sensing so we can able to categorize the majority of the data deficient species under some kind of threat stage, threat status then the one more important issue for the conservation of biodiversity is the biological invasion of alien species you know that the cbd convention biological diversity visualized that the second threat to biodiversity is the the invasion of alien species the first threat is the deforestation the second threat is the the invasion of the alien species so this is the one photograph of the banni grassland in gujarat it is one of the virgin and pristine grassland earlier but for the last 40 50 years the majority of the landscapes are now encroached by the prosopy giliflora so here how we quantified and how we monitored i am showing in the form of a map this is the area known as the run of kutch biosphere reserve in kutch district in gujarat and uh, like if you see in the 1975 itself the one complete kadir bet area is occupied by the prosopy giliflora and once if you see that one zoom zoom portion of kutch area the, we can able to uh, assess the and we can able to um, map the areas of spreading in different time periods so based on this kind of information at least we can able to preserve the remaining grasslands of banni grasslands of gujarat and we, the study we did for as part of the landscape level biodiversity characterization project we did uh, survey in rajasthan state we did sampling by covering around 2000 sample plots of each of is like 20 meter by 20 meter plot so within that also like out of 2000 sample plots almost 1200 to 200 plots are invaded by different types of invasive species like prosopis lantana camera ageratum chromolina hyptis parthenium argimon so this database is directly helpful to the um, state forest departments to take the proper uh, conservation measures to stop the at least the, they can able to uh, identify these areas as the in a first phase and they can able to control the further spread of the invasive species then i am showing one more few more applications of the remote sensing of identifying a key habitats for biodiversity conservation so here i am showing one map the biological richness map this map is a product of one nation wide program conducted as part of landscape level biodiversity characterization nation level and it is supported by more than 100 institutions who are having like universities who are having expertise in taxonomy and ecology and they have done uh, sampling across the country and based on their inputs and based on the remote sensing inputs 
we could able to map the potential potential areas of high biological richness in country and we have shared all the databases with the, all the state forest departments to use this database and also we shared these databases with the state uh, biodiversity boards to use in their management plans so this kind of databases help very are very much helpful for the all the state forest departments to identify new wildlife sanctuaries or new national parks then in taxonomist we were always want to discover some new species or we would like to re report uh, new records so where to get your new records and new species and this kind of information is also very much is useful and this is a map of intact forest landscapes per country so by using the last eight decades information and by, by using the disturbance sources information like forest fire deforestation road railway network and agricultural areas so once removing all kinds of disturbances on the forest we are having only the 237 intact forest landscapes in country so they are not found in andhra pradesh and telangana or orissa they are only distributed in arunachal pradesh sikkim uttarakhand himachal pradesh jammu and kashmir and kerala so if you use this maps for your inventory purpose you you may you can able to explore some new species and new records then by utilizing the principles of the convention on biological diversity because the one of the mandate of convention on biological diversity is to identify the biologically significant areas so here it is not only considered the biological richness information or not only the intact richness information we need to integrate some other factors some other criteria like the rare ecosystems ecosystem rarity it is also known as uniqueness like shola forest is one of the rare ecosystem like mangrove is one of the rare ecosystem and then forest intactness already i said that the last eight decades there is no disturbance to those forest areas then the we already we identified the biological rich forest and here also further not only the biological richness information we have to identify the high biomass forest so mostly the dense forest areas will have more biomass so we integrated the biomass map we integrated the core forest map we integrated the persistent forest information like the that forest is surviving from 1930 to this date so whichever area is satisfying all the six criteria which receives high conservation ranking and whatever the areas are having only like one kind of the criterion that will go under the low conservation ranking so this database is also very much useful for the conservation management and the uh, for identifying the uh, good number of wildlife sanctuaries and protected areas then the recently we initiated one activity at nrsc i gave as one topic to one of my mphil Uh, student she worked on the identifying the locations of the new species and also some endemic species here the new species means they are also probably like endemic species now so here we consulted the uh, different literature published by botanical society of india and the other taxonomists and we found that in the last decade around 1097 species were reported by the plant taxonomists in india but out of 1097 We we got around 700 species locations because every taxonomist may not report the exact latitude and longitude. So we consulted the different research papers and we found that for around 700 species, we found the location specific latitude and longitude. So uh, here I am showing those locations of those new plant species which are described in the last uh, 10 years. So by having this location specific information. now we are, we can able to report that is there any habitat loss or habitat degradation in those locations so once we are having such kind of geo referenced information we can able to uh, make use of this database and we can able to take a, the uh, the precise conservation steps for a long term management of the biodiversity then once you are having the specific location information and we can able to go for the areas of habitat suitability and areas of the potential distribution of the species so here once we are having like the field location information of the like for a given species you may be having like 20 locations or 25 locations 
but we have we need to collect this information by using a global positioning system gps so once we are having a precise location information and by incorporating the ecological variables this databases of ecological variables will get free access from the worldclim.org website so there are around 23 ecological variables all related to temperature elevation elevation precipitation so once you integrate this 23 ecological variables with the field locations you can able to identify the uh, potential distribution of the species so this database is also helpful for for example like some species are having or surviving only in few locations so by using this predicted map of the suitability we can able to uh, make some kind of rehabilitation efforts for the long term cover for the long term sustenance of species then coming to the flora of, of telangana so as a this date there are around 2139 species got reported in different publications they are like the dicots are in high in number like more than 1500 dicots and around 500 species are monocots it means once you are publishing a flora it means it is not a end it is a beginning for the all the young researchers to take up this these studies further so i am showing that how the uh, baseline information will help us in taking a more uh, exploration and to identify more number of additions to the given state so this is the one study i published in 2010 so at that time the adilabad is not divided into four districts it is a very one of the largest district in andhra pradesh then here what i did is that here i collected the information from the different herbaria and i found that the the exploration is conducted, conducted only in 21 locations and to represent systematically i categorized the district into a equal sized cells like each cell is having 10 km by 10 km area why i adapted for cell size the grid cell is we, we don't have a exact gps location for each specimen collection so i considered like one location as like a 10 by 10 km is represents the one location so based on that we are having like 200 locations or 200 grid cells but the exploration was conducted only in 21 grid cells it means only 10% of the areas got explored and further we can able to make a ranking based on the number of specimen collections like the red in the, here indicates the more than 100 species are collected from that site and the pink indicates the 51 to 100 species were collected from that site then here based on this map we can say that the northern part of adilabad was completely unexplored similarly the eastern part of adilabad also relatively unexplored and later uh, 2010 the botanical survey of india also conducted extensive studies in the adilabad district that is currently known as a kaval tiger reserve so once if you overlay the old district with information with the new districts we can able to even prioritize our efforts for example uh, now the adilabad is having four districts the current adilabad is almost unexplored or underexplored so the researchers like you you have to take up the exploration in those uh, areas uh, to have a better uh, accountability of the species similarly kumarambim asifabad also underexplored okay Hello. Yes, sir. Sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir, uh, your uh, session is over, no, sir. Yes. Yeah, uh, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Uh, we have few questions in the chat box. Can we go for it or? Uh... Yes, yes, yes. You go. Yes, for yes. It. We can go for. It. We can go for. It. Yes, sir. That's a Sudhakar question. Sir. Sudhakar yeah, sir. I'm, I'm, Please, yeah, uh, uh, there are few questions, sir. Please answer them, sir. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, Sadhana, you ask. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, is it possible to zoom the area and see clearly and identify the species perfectly through remote sensing? 
in and each species, yeah. each species has numerous spectral uh, signatures how can we predict the particular species yeah for, for that purpose like the remote imaging is not only having like, one kind of imaging we are having different kind of images like the one image is having like four spectral bands it will only identify like blue green red and infrared now we are having hyperspectral remote sensing it accommodates more than 200 spectral bands so once you know the uh, identity of species for example like the tectona grandis or mangifera indica so once you train the area it will identify the areas wherever the tectona grandis or wherever the mangifera indica is prevailing so it will help you but initially you have to give identify some places as a one species because it is not a true representation of the species it is a virtual so you have to go to the field and you have to uh, give the spectral library kind of information to the given place then automatically for the entire area we can able to identify the distribution of the particular species yes sadhana yes sir uh, if we want to predict the conservation status of our local species which are in danger yeah. of extinction what is the procedure to follow as a botanist no in a the in the conventional studies like floristics or taxonomy we are collecting the herbarium specimen and we are writing that the species is common occasional or rare but the problem with the taxonomic information is that the identity is okay but the pro but it is common occasional rare there is no quantification we have to do the some kind of sampling and we have to estimate the species population then only we can able to prioritize those species for conservation otherwise just by having the identity and just by having the location we can't able to say that the habitat is under threat or habitat is going to improve so we have to do the field sampling and we have to estimate the species population by using remote sensing technique uh, is there any possibility to locate locate all the endangered and the endemic species of telangana state yeah sure sure yeah we, we can like uh, already shown like forest fire information deforestation information even like the, the previously explored areas may not be available now earlier like in the 1990s uh, the taxonomists have got them some survey in some place but the forest may not be surviving now so we can able to call a link it the location information with the satellite imagery and we can able to say that that species is still exist or it vanished we able to so we need to link that herbarium data also with the remote data. that's it sir thank you sir uh, yeah. uh, sir sir another question from uh, another uh, uh, some participants sir uh, yeah. they are asking that uh, when there is a possibility of uh, Uh, predicting uh, forest fire earlier itself why we are seeing is there any uh, uh, lacuna in uh, giving the information to the government or uh, uh, government is taking negligent steps like that they are asking sir yeah the forest fire or even deforestation is yeah. not the mostly not due to the natural factors the forest fires are mostly due to human made anthropogenic interferences here the forest is not fire is not natural so if it is a natural phenomena we can able to predict through uh, studying phenological patterns like the greening of vegetation browning of vegetation so, like if it is a, like uh, impact of climate change or impact of global warming on vegetation that we can able to predict the areas of threat but the forest fire we don't know that who are going to put fire uh, but the only thing we can able to Say that because the last forty years data is available with us, we can able to identify the vulnerable areas of fire. We can't able to say that what are the areas because we don't know the human mind. Thank you. Sir, kindly unmute your mic, sir. Sudha Kerala, sir. It's okay now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so we can, we, can, we can able to identify the vulnerable zones. We can't able to say that the one particular person will go there and he will put fire. Uh, is the remote sensing yes. useful to categorize or identify the forest types based on spectral bands? Yeah, yeah, yes. That study we already did and published. Yeah. 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 Y
is that is purely based on the spectral bands like your the phenology is one of the major criterion like each vegetation type is very unique give with reference to the area like the if you take the dry is forest its start of season it means leaf onset new leaf season is different as compared with the maharashtra uh, madhya pradesh similarly the length of greening season also vary from one place to another place so by using this kind of the variability in the phenology and like length length of growing season leaf onset leaf offset so similar kind of uh, principles we will consider while categorizing the forest types not only that types we have to consider the climatic zones we have to consider the elevation zones while identifying the uh, forest types sir uh, another question sir uh, uh, you also said that th there is a possibility of even assessment of biomass how it is possible sir the like in the if you saw that lidar slide yes the, like, uh, how actually in the remote sensing it is not direct estimate in the like in the field you are doing some kind of a plot for the data special study you are measuring girth and height okay but uh, once we are having that location specific information tree girth and height by using the appropriate anthropometric equation and by uh, using the appropriate the upscaling methods in gis we can able to estimate the uh, different levels of biomass it is not that the remote sensing only give you the like information like dense forest open forest and the different shades of greenness but we have to link it that the uh, uh, the sample plot of uh, open forest is having this much of tons of biomass the sample plot of uh, dense forest is having this many tons of biomass so it is only that uh, linking of like upscaling of information from plot level to regional level that we will do with the remote sensing Sadhana, are there are any uh, other no, questions? No, ma'am. We are done, ma'am. We are done with the questions. Ma huh. Amanji, sir. Over to Nageshwar Amanji, sir. Sir, please unmute your mic. Hey, madam, are there are no questions? Okay, sir. Sir, you are not audible, sir. I think I am audible, madam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Audible. Yeah. Sir, please unmute. Yeah. Um. yeah, there are no questions from the yeah, there are no questions from the audience side. If that is the case. So please propose the vote of thanks, madam. Just call, madam. Great pleasure uh, to give vote of thanks to the eminent uh, uh, resource person, uh, Dr. C. Sudhakar Reddy, sir, uh, from NRSC. He has enlightened our participants with uh, uh, the link, connection between uh, biodiversity uh, and the remote sensing, GIS. So actually, uh, uh, majority of the participants, they were asking that uh, a starter, uh, without having any such uh, remote sensing and GIS knowledge, how we should enter into uh, this field, they are asking. That was uh, a common question from the participants. Sir. Uh, they will be contacting you in further due course, but you have uh, given a very uh, nice connection between uh, 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 biodiversity as well as how we can use uh, the remote sensing technology to identify uh, different ecosystems and uh, different uh, 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 what biodiversified areas and all. And you have also enlightened uh, different applications of this uh, biodiversity and this uh, remote sensing uh, 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 studies um, in especially knowing uh, the uh, canopies height volume uh, shrub layer and identification of biomass etc and uh, with this uh, remote sensing data uh, 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 which uh, you people are generating and also you have gave uh, uh, the uh, uh, information is available in Bhuvan portal. Uh, majority of the researchers they can uh, utilize this uh, opportunity, sir. Uh, and uh, you have also enlightened uh, how these uh, uh, data is useful uh, for the different researchers and also decision makers, especially in uh, curbing the forest fires or uh, uh, in different. Uh, uh, 
conservation practices and all. Uh, and uh, there is also possibility to identify how the alien species are dominating in particular ecosystems and all. And uh, the, these uh, remote sensing and GIS data is very much useful in knowing even these uh, uh, type of problems also. And uh, uh, the uh, your uh, lecture was also highlighting how uh, the biological richness can be studied and evaluated. Uh, uh, so these are all the things uh, which were very, very useful to our participants as well as uh, uh, to the organizers also. Uh, we all are enlightened with your uh, uh, great talk, sir. Uh, we are very fortunate to have you here in spite of your busy uh, schedule uh, uh, officially. Uh, you spared uh, a good time uh, for this uh, uh, short term course, sir. We are very, very happy to have you here, sir. Thank you very, very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much, sir. sir. Welcome. Sir, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you uh, from the, all the organizers, from the participants once again. Thank you, Dr. Amanji, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, further also we will be uh, coming to uh, our rescue, sir. Definitely we will be coming to our uh, rescue, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Presentation, collaboration. We need your collaboration. Yes, sir. Definitely, sir. Definitely, sir. Because uh, our university uh, needs to have such uh, expert collaboration, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, sir. Thank you. Any any uh, uh, announcements, Mr. Rajan? Yes, sir. Uh, we'll be coming with the attendance and come uh, evaluation form within 15 to 20 minutes. So you go for your lunch and come back by 2 o'clock. Meanwhile, we will share uh, in the WhatsApp groups and uh, we'll also share the link once you join in the afternoon session also. Mr. Rajan, if possible, uh, you also announce uh, who will be the next speaker so that uh, people will be ready with the content. Yeah, no, I think we have, have shared the there, links, madam. Uh, so, Mayur, Dr. Dr. Mayur sir will be there. Dr. Karnakar Reddy will be in the post lunch sessions. Okay. Okay. As per the schedule, as per the schedule, same speakers will be there. Okay. Yeah, as per okay, the schedule, sir. sir um, okay. uh, there are two speakers, and uh, one speaker will speak from uh, two to three p.m. The next speaker from three to four p.m. Okay. Okay. No. Thank you. So now we are ending the session. Uh, please have your lunch and come back by 2 o'clock. By 1.45 or 150, we will uh, open the uh, link again. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. you, madam. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you. Thank you, Sujan and Sadhana. Sir.